Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Hello, and welcome to Champions of Psychology, a show with the goal of openly talking about mental health and gaming presented by Codename Entertainment and TakeThis.org. Every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on Twitch.tv slash CNE Games or later on your favorite podcast service, Mitra Georgian and Rafael Bucamazzo, a.k.a. Dr. V, talk about mental health in these unprecedented times as well as how gaming affects us. If you're here with us live in the chat, you can leave a question that I, Trevor Bettis, will ask them later in the show. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, uh, who, who are you two lovely people? <clears throat> Would you like to start with me? <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems to be the established tradition at oh, this point. Tradition. I didn't actually realize that, but sure. Um, so I'm Mitra Jordan, as announced. I think you can even see it below. Um, I'm a registered <laughs> clinical counselor. I work in Victoria, BC in private practice, um, and I work with various people. Um, and I'm also neurodivergent, uh, which uh, we're going to talk about this time. Mm -hmm. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I am Dr. Rafael Bocamazzo, better known as Dr. B for long Italian name reasons. And I am the clinical director over at takethis.org. We were the first mental health nonprofit to serve the game community. And yeah, you can check out what we do at takethis.org or follow us on all the socials at takethisorg or you can follow me right down there at the Dr. B. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm also an expert on the applied use of uh, tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons in clinical and learning settings. And for the sake of today, well, for the sake of every day, really, but we're really just going to point a, a spotlight on it today. Uh, I am autistic and... We're going to talk about that. Yeah. In detail. Yeah, th this was uh this and next week's episodes was was pitched by Mitra and uh we just thought it was a really good idea of doing an AMA about autism since Dr. B has been very open about that and doing one about ADHD since Mitra and I have been very open about that. Um and yeah, th this is basically yeah, we're shining the spotlight on it this week. And um where where exactly do you want to start with this? Oh, well, I, I will actually. I should explain for the for chat just real quick. Put your questions in chat now. Uh, your AMA questions, because that's going to be the second half of the episode. When we come back from the disclaimer, we'll be doing those. Uh, for right now, we're just going to be talking. Uh, we're going to be talking about what Doctor B wants to talk about with it and his experiences with it. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, uh, and you know, I'm. Uh, this is this is your opportunity, Chad. If there's if there's questions you have about either. Because I'm in an interesting position in that I, I straddle the line between both the clinical world and the lived experience world in this case. And, oh, I just realized how low my, my, there we go. Let's, there you yeah, go. Yeah, you can see the entirety of my head. <laughs> um, hey, look at that. I'm actually completely in frame now. Mm -hmm. uh, but the. Well, mine might be a bit weird. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but it's okay. I, I, I know. I the... can't actually look at anyone. I'm going to be side eyeing every single person in this show if I don't <laughs> fix it. Okay, so if my face looks funny and, and I don't look like I'm looking at the camera, it's because I'm kind of not. But uh, anyway, go on. <laughs> but um, if you have any questions about what it's like to be autistic, um, at least from my perspective, and I really want to preface, uh, preface this whole conversation with for the most part, I'm going to be talking about my experiences uh, because the the lived experiences of different um, different. Did I lose you guys? No, no, we're still. I'm still here. You're still here. I oh, can see you. I can hear problems? you. Can't see anyone. Um, 
the but yeah what 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 basically what's autism like for me um you know given that i'm also a doctor of clinical psychology I had, and i used to work with people on the spectrum back in the days when i worked with people instead of doing you know all policy work um i uh i uh yeah, so I've got a lot of say. I'm if I'm stumbling over my words. Oh, we did lose me, Trip. Oh, um, she's back. If I'm okay. if I'm stumbling over my words a little bit, uh, it's only because I'm currently Mitra Jordan and I'm facing a new reality. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. You're, there, you're thank back. Thank you. So yeah, the. It, this is something that's very personal and I'm really trying to be as open as possible on this. And I'm, I'm feeling some feels uh, mm -hmm. on this one. So I'm, I'm probably going to be uh, stumbling over my words quite a bit where well, we wanted to start was just talking about what is autism mm -hmm. from a, from a technical perspective, because there's a lot of people who don't really even know what it is. They have a lot of, I think bad ideas based on media representation of autism, which has historically been not great. And so, to to start things off, um, autism is we we have to we have to think about the model we're looking at. I'm getting really technical here, uh, and all diagnoses are conceived from what's called the medical model, and the medical model tends to look at deficits in regards to a, a perceived norm. And I, I use the term normal with impunity simply because um, I, I, because it's not a bad term where people run into problems with that term normal is where they start conflating it with good. There are plenty of things that are, we've talked about this in previous episodes, where there are plenty of things in this world that are statistically abnormal that are wonderful. Um, and there's plenty of things that are statistically normal, but eh, kind of a drag. And so I, I, when, as I talk about normal, I want, to, I want to be clear that I'm using it in a statistical term, not in a moral judgment, good or bad kind of way, because that's, that, that's an important distinction. And the, so the medical model looks at deficits from a perceived norm. And autism has a little bit of controversy in there because a lot of people, and I'm one of them, believe that those of us on the spectrum are just simply on a dip. Uh, uh, on a different operating system. And the reason we don't function as well is because we're basically Linux in a Windows world and we're expected to act like Windows. And that doesn't work. I will never be able to be a different operating system than what I am. But from the medical model, what autism is, is a neurodevelopmental diagnosis present from a very early age. That's why it's neurodevelopmental. It's not something you just wake up in your 20s and, oops, I'm autistic. Um, it, this, was, this has been there my entire life. And it's a combination of a couple of things. One, a, a not understanding social cues, social communication, social ideas, nonverbal communication, emotional reciprocity, meaning like, you know, when you talk to someone and you give them a, a compliment or something and there's some good warm feelings there, there's this kind of unspoken expectation that they're going to offer good warm feelings back. And those of us on the spectrum often struggle with that, like heavily. Um, additionally, there's other things because in and of itself, that's technically called social communication disorder. But there's, there's more to it than this. So there's repetitive stereotyped behaviors uh, for a lot of us, a need for sameness and rigidity, as well as a lot of sensory idiosyncrasies. I have a lot of sensory idiosyncrasies, which is good and bad for when I cook, because I'm I'm hyper I, I'm hypersensitive to noises. I'm hypersensitive to tastes, to smells. Um, I can like smell. <laughs> Yeah, I can smell things two floors away. I can hear certain noises two floors away. It, you said it drove my ex-wife up the wall when I was like, ah, you're chewing with your mouth open. I was like three rooms away. Yeah. Um, but all, but it's, it's also an important distinction to recognize that as we talk about this, I'm probably going to be describing some things that a lot of you have some experience with. And there are... 
there are a lot of aspects about the autism experience that maybe you identify with a little bit. It's really important to understand it's not considered autism unless a lot of this stuff is present and present to the point that it causes significant impairments mm -hmm. in the way you live your life. I, I can't, I, I don't want to say can't, but I have gotten so good at recognizing social scripts and living within social scripts um, that I actually, I blend a lot of the times. It's when you put me in new situations or even in um, romantic relationships, that's where it's way more obvious because I can't just mimic behaviors in those certain, in those circumstances. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what autism is from the technical perspective mm. uh the what we also we also had the question that we talked about ahead of time of when was i diagnosed i was diagnosed mm. when i was 35 i was well well into my life before i was diagnosed and the um it was, it, I, I didn't recognize it. Other people, uh, other people recognized it before I did. Because to me, a lot of my own experiences were just, I thought they were normal. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. it's what I grew up with. It's what I knew. Mm -hmm. And it was other people starting, starting, starting to suggest that, Hey, we've noticed that a lot of times you're like, if, if a social scenario was like a partner dance, um, there were a lot of times where I was like half step out of time and it has caused some problems for me with jobs. It has caused some problems with me, um, socially. It has caused problems with, for me with romantic relationships because people expect me to respond a certain way. And it's certain ways that are really difficult for me, really difficult for me in some mm -hmm. cases, practically impossible. And so it was in the, in the, the sort of death throes of my marriage that I went and got tested. Um, and they, uh, it, it was actually a little challenging for me to get tested because one, most clinicians don't really specialize in adult autism because it's an emerging field of study that is in many cases about 20 years behind in terms of research um, with things like ADHD. ADHD research is way ahead of autism in terms of people's understanding. And the, um, and so, yeah, I, my, I didn't understand why we were having difficulties in my marriage and I went and finally got tested, which it took me months to find somebody <laughs> because I was trained on most common assessment tools, being a doctor of psychology. I had to find someone who not only specialized in aut adult autism, but they specialized well enough to get around all of the tests I know. Mm. And because otherwise, if they test me and I know the answers, it's not a valid test. So when they, they tested me and I got diagnosed, it was, it's tough to explain because it's like nothing changed, but everything was different. I was still me, but I was me with this whole new lens. And there were a lot of moments in my life, and there's still a lot of moments in my in my life and my past where I go, I look back at that and go, ooh, yeah, yeah, that that uh, that that was an autism moment. That was that was definitely an autism moment. Yeah, I can't can't lie about that. And so uh, that's that's I, I don't know i help me out gang i'm 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 yeah. deep in my own no, thoughts and my okay. feelings yeah, you're here. doing great you're doing great i'm wondering how it felt for you to like what it what was it like to review your life in oh. that way you know because you had one experience just going through it and, you, and it felt normal to you but then like this process of kind of looking back and going oh wait you know mm -hmm. yeah um and I'm going to warn the chat. I am probably going to cry at some point, maybe sooner than later. Um, because what it felt like is not a line. It's not a, a linear thing. Mm. Because 
what I, what we're talking about is a, a new identity, uh, is a new aspect of my identity because, you know, here we are about four years later and I'm still coming to terms with what it means to have a social disability. Mm. And it is, for me, a social disability and it's an invisible one. It's one that, and we have a lot of biases about even that word disability. And the, there's more and more evidence to to point to the idea that the longer it is before one is diagnosed with, you know, ADHD or autism or other, you know, learning disabilities, neurodevelopmental stuff, the more internalized hatred, the more, the more internalized negativity that we have to undo. And I'm no exception to that. I mean, four years later and I'm, and I'm really just starting to come to terms with the idea that the whole of my life, I've just thought of myself as a broken version of normal because I thought I was the same operating system as everybody else. But instead, you know, so at first it was shock. It was kind of a relief to have a label for that, that my, my experiences were common enough that there were enough people that there was a label for this and throughout most all my life i mean there were so many aspects of things that are you know typically male that i don't enjoy and it turns out research is saying that um those of us on the spectrum tend to um sort of either be gender diver to basically be gender divergent to varying degrees at a rate of five times the typical population there's a lot of folks on the spectrum who identifies you know they're non-binary trans um or even just eschew typical gender roles and a lot of the stuff i did didn't fall within that that scope of what it was to you know be a guy um I like to cook. I like theater. I like words. I like, I like music. Um, I'll watch, I'll watch sports ball games as a social thing. Um, just to, just to be around people, but I don't voluntarily sit down for three hours and watch the Seahawks crash into other people at, <laughs> at high speeds. Um, and so, you know, part of me wanted to give the flippant answer to this cause I, I often, and do that as a way of deflecting from very uncomfortable emotions um, when you ask what did it feel like and I, I wanted to say fluffy but um, now the, the truth is it's it's like a series of oscillations that continue and some days I'm okay with it some days I'm I'm not okay with it because I exist in a world where I'm outnumbered 50 to 1 by people who expect me to act a certain way and because i'm so good at i'm so good at blending in because and i, I want to be clear about this um this is not me bragging this is um this is me just saying how i flew under the radar when i got tested and it surprised the hell out of me um i really mean that that they um the neuropsychologist came back with uh, perceptual reasoning scores, which are my, my ability to recognize like patterns, um, visual spatial cues, that sort of things, those sort of things. And I, I just about blew the top off the test. And he came back uh, with, so you're gifted. And I was like, what? <laughs> I always felt so behind on everything. <laughs> and it turns out that my ability to recognize patterns is what helped me fly under the radar. Mm -hmm. I'm so good at recognizing people's behavioral patterns and imitating them that I seemed normal to everybody else. And my, my entire teenage experience was, I, I make a joke about it, but I'm really not joking, that it was basically me doing this constant ethnographic anthropology experiment where I'm going through talking to people and just kind of documenting in my brain. Okay, social response 54A was, I don't see negative response. Try 54B next time and see how that goes. And that's, that's basically how it was for me. And it is for me all the time. This is not an occasional thing. I am consciously thinking about this 25-8. It is exhausting. 
Mm -hmm. I was just it thinking. Is so exhausting. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, how it feels is it, it, how it feels is sort of a a tricky thing because um, the the metaphor I've really come to use recently, and this has only been in the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm a huge, huge, huge Beatles fan. Huge Beatles fan. For those of you in the chat who know what this song is, um, cool. If you don't and you can stand the intensity of what I'm about to say, give it a shot. But um, <laughs> don't, don't if it's too distressing, go listen to the Beatles song Revolution 9. Put it on headphones. Put it on your headphones. And um, for me, autism is like living inside that all the time, mm. all the time. And it's jarring, it's disjointed, it's confusing. And the best I can hope for is some things to help turn the volume down. That's what it feels like all the time for me. And talking to people, anybody, it doesn't matter who, I'm constantly thinking about what I'm supposed to be doing because the, 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 the other side of this, and this is a really common thing with autism. This is a really common thing with ADHD. This is a really common thing with several different diagnoses is a form of um, rejection sensitivity. Now you, you may, I, I have a whole thing about this because um, you, for those of you in the chat, you may have heard the concept rejection sensitivity dysphoria. That's a BS term, by the way, that's an entire show unto itself. Um, How to ADHD did a really good, epi a really good episode on why that's kind of a BS term. Um, but rejection sensitivity is a very real thing in so many diagnoses because for autism, for ADHD and for a variety of other things, we're literally go, we're doing things wrong and we do things wrong enough that we're told sometimes two months later, cause it wasn't that big of a deal, but somebody tells us like two months later. And so after a couple decades of this, it becomes this living constant experience of trying to not do things wrong because maybe this is the time that I'm really going to hurt someone because I didn't understand or I didn't know any better. And I won't find out for months and I'm fully unaware that I did it unintentionally despite my best efforts. And it's so much effort. It is so much effort. It's like a program running in the back of my mind at 50% capacity for my RAM all the time, all the time. And I have a diminished RAM capacity compared to most people. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's another thing. Um, a lot of us on the spectrum are, um, a lot of us on the spectrum. So if you think about cognitive abilities for most people uh, in the way that, um, in the way that most people are, if you think of cognitive abilities kind of like Dungeons and Dragons, most people have fairly even scores across all. You know, there's a little bit of variation, but there's some e fairly even scores across all of them. For a lot of us on the spectrum, we're min-maxers. Mm -hmm. So you see a split in abilities. Um, and in my case, to go back to the computer metaphor, my, my, my graphics card is like running two linked 3090s. My hard drives are like two, two four terabyte solid state drives, but my CPU and RAM suck. And so like one half of my brain can't keep up with the other, what the other half wants to do. And it's so aggravating because I know I can do something. I should be able to do something, but I can't. And I'm surrounded by people who are world-class and brilliant. And it's, it's embarrassing um, a lot of time to have them f to feel like I have to be handheld the entire time to understand something. Mm -hmm. And so it's, this is where, to go back to Mitra's question about what it feels like, this is what I, I'm still, like I said, I'm still coming to terms with the whole disability idea, the model of it, the, the identity of it, that there are certain things that as an adult capable male, I'm supposed to be able to do 
that I can't. I truly, truly cannot. And the things I need to do that are what a lot of people would consider marks of weakness or moral ineptitude. Mm -hmm. I am truly dependent on other people in ways that other people are not. I have to rely on them to survive. Um, and that's a, it's a, yeah. So, uh, um, but, uh, before we, uh, get to the, to our mid show disclaimer, do, do Oh you, God, are we already? Yeah, at we the... yeah, no, we, we've cool. been talking for a bit. Uh, did, did you, are you up to talking about meltdowns? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's talk about meltdowns. They look different for everybody on the spectrum. Uh, but for me, it is, it, it's, it's, I don't know what's happening when I'm in the middle of them. I mean, I know I'm distressed because there's, there's something, there's something called alexithymia, which is something that's, it's not technically a diagnostic criterion of, of autism, but it's super common super common in those of us on the spectrum. And what alexithymia is, is difficulties or inability to identify internal, emotional, or, uh, you know, affective or physiological states. I, I, I often just, I can't name my own emotions a lot of the time. And the way I just, the, the metaphor I use for that is like my emotional experiences are kind of like a glacier. It, it looks really homogenous at first glance and it's really slow moving but really intense when it hits you and crushing and i don't i and a lot of other folks on the spectrum don't have much of a middle ground between in control in control it's fine and overload it's like a light switch gets flipped and then it's suddenly too much and all i can experience is the distress and i just collapse in some cases quite physically and repetitive, intrusive thoughts. And the last week I, I actually had a couple of them. Um, and they, I, oh God, it, there's such an emotional hangover afterwards, but all I, the only thing that exists in those moments is the distress, the thought, whatever is making me have that meltdown, that overload, the, the, uh, uh, the sensory experiences, everything. And it's so intense that I actually forget I have a body I, f I kind of forget I'm in a room and often the very first thing I notice when I come out of this is, oh, hey, look, the walls are real again. Or a really intense, like hyper-focused moment I had um, several months ago and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even joking, it was so weird. I, I, look, I was at my desk where I'm sitting right now and I just got into this hyper-focused thought loop for two hours and I didn't realize two hours had passed. And I looked down and I was like, oh, I have hands. That's weird. And it just becomes that distress, that hyper focus. Like a lot of people say they get really into a flow state. These sorts of hyper focus and meltdown moments are so different than a flow state. It's almost yeah. dissociative. And I just, you know, throughout growing up, when I got overloaded like this, I just was often told I'm being melodramatic. I need to toughen up or some variation of that when I'm on a different operating system. And most of my sen most of my physical experiences are kind of heightened compared to other people. I experience pain more, uh, I'm told, uh, I experience pain more intensely. I experience discomfort more intensely. Like I, I joke about all the beer I make and I joke about all, you know, that I, I, I drink alcohol. Um, that's because I actually like the taste of it. I hate the effects. <laughs> because that I, I truly hate the effects um, and because that's more confusion and predictability and confusion is absolutely one of the worst experiences I could have that more than anything else will make me have one of those meltdowns and those can last hours so yeah there's a welcome welcome to my world kids <laughs> Um, a lot to unpack. Well, uh, let's uh, go ahead and take our mid-show disclaimer, and uh, we'll come back with some questions uh, after that. Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. 
It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Okay, uh, first off, before we get into the questions, Dr. B, I just want to say everybody loves you, and you're, we're, we're, thank you so much for doing this talk. I, I know it's taken a lot out of you, but we really do appreciate it. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's uh, on the topic of emotions. Um, emotions are kind of, you know, I mentioned the alexithymia a couple moments ago. Emotions are really intense mm -hmm. for me, and um, sitting within them for a while is um, it is a it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. So, um, thanks for bearing with me, gang. Yeah, we we appreciate and love you. Um, I think the first question that we're going to do, uh, is from, uh, Reculti, uh, which has question, where on the spectrum do you fall? Um, generally where there's things in my path. And <laughs> the, um, uh, that we're, we're prone to, we're prone to challenges in terms of proprioception. So we're a bit clumsy, uh, but, um, no, I'm, I'm being flippant because that's the, that's a tough question to answer. Uh, there it, the clinical terms that are used for uh, for that, where people fall in terms of functionality, um, are are controversial within the autism community, and I understand why. I, I I honestly believe that my industry has not done enough to educate people on why certain terms are used. So, uh, actually, take this is going to have a, a small video coming out about uh, this and uh, soon, I, I think, that uh, what, quote, mild things mean in clinical terms. The, the metaphor I like to use is a scale of 1 to 10. And if you imagine routine experiences falling between, like, 1 and 5 and clinical experiences between 5 to 10 in terms of impact and distress... It's within that already high end of five to ten that the terms like mild, me, you know, moderate and severe in clinical terms are framed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I say I have, quote, mild autism, I'm already in that five to ten range. And um, the other tricky, the other tricky part about any diagnosis, not just autism, but any diagnosis, is the sheer level of variance in presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, something I've said on this show before is that depression, major depressive disorder, pro it, referred to as the common cold of mental health. There are nine diagnostic criteria for depress a major depressive disorder. You have to meet five out of nine for a period of two weeks or more. There are something, somebody did the math at one point, I forget what the number was, but there was something like 54,000 54, like 54, different possible variations of depression alone. And autism has multiple dimensions. And so, um, and a lot of variance because like my cognitive challenges are not other people's cognitive challenges. Now, incidentally, there are some common ones such as working memory and concentration to the point that for it's actually in the D, the diagnostic manual that if somebody has an autism diagnosis, you expect them to have ADHD symptoms. Um, so I, yeah, so there's a lot of different variations. And on top of that, like my sensory idiosyncrasies are not the same as other people's sensory idiosyncrasies. And my, um, my skill sets, um, I, my skill sets make up for certain things in certain ways. Like if, if this was a D and D game, I've got a wisdom score of eight. Okay. I, there's a lot of quote, obvious things that I miss, but I have double, <laughs> I have like double proficiency in both investigation, basically in investigation. So I recognize patterns to the point that in people's behaviors that I can kind of label their emotions 
with cognitive empathy. Um, and that's the way I experience it. Um, so my, my challenges are not the same as other people's challenges. And so I, I would actually challenge you that if you've got somebody, somebody in, in your life who is autistic, and you feel comfortable and you've got a strong enough relationship with them that you can honestly ask. Ask them what their autism is like. Like I have conversations with my friends who are on the spectrum and I'm like, so how does yours manifest differently than mine? And so I get, I, I get to know like what their idiosyncrasies are versus mine. And I, I use that word a lot, idiosyncrasies, because I'm, I, I like it because it's kind of an, it's a non-judgmental word. Mm -hmm. It's just a thing that's different. There's no judgment about it. There's no nothing. It's just, you've got something that's a little different than other people. Okay. So, um, yeah. So anyway, okay. that. Um, let's see, where was that next? Oh, uh, uh, Luca F uh, Fenier says, uh, what's your thoughts on, quote, functioning labels, and how can we improve the way that the general public think about the spectrum? Um, so the idea of functioning labels, I kind of touched on uh, uh, just a moment ago. Bearing in mind that I understand what they mean clinically, I have no problem with them. But mm -hmm. that's because I understand what they mean clinically. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think it's on my industry to fix that. I think it's on my I think it's on my industry to educate people better. There's there's no shortage of research that talks about how powerful psychoeducation is in terms of helping people understand where they're at and what they can what they can do and how things might manifest in their life. But again, back when I worked with people, I cannot tell you how many times I like made a, I worked with teenagers, so they appreciated, they often appreciated some well-natured sarcasm. And there, there were so many times that these, these teenagers I worked with who had diagnoses their entire lives, like maybe ADHD or depression or anxiety or whatever. And I would say something like, well, yeah, but you know what that means. And they look at me like, no, I don't. I'm like, did nobody ever tell you what ADHD actually is? Mm. And they were like, no, do you want to do that right now? And they were like, yeah, actually. And so I would go, I would get my, the, the diagnostic manual and we'd start going through the list. Like here are the symptoms. And then we would spend like an hour talking about how it can manifest in their life. And for so many of them, no one had ever done that for them mm -hmm. ever in over a decade in some cases. And so from a clinical, so going back to your question, from a clinical perspective, I have no problem with somebody saying I'm high functioning autistic, but that again, that's specifically because I understand what the clinical implications of that are. My, like Mitra and my industry, they do not do a good enough job. We do not do a good enough job of educating the public on what that actually means. There's a lot of people that just slap a label on it and just play, you know, the drop, you know, tuck and roll it, it, it with no explanation. And that does people a disservice, a massive disservice, because then. And because then um, people uh, people come uh, come to us, or or they go to people saying I have mild depression, or I have high functioning autism, or whatever, and people are like, oh yeah, well then that's no big deal. You're high functioning. It's mild. No, it's still a big deal because it has to make yeah. a massive impact to even get that label. And so that I to again to go and to go back to your to go back to your question. I, I, I really think it's our, it's our responsibility to do better towards the general population. And additionally, those, those labels have usefulness. They also have limitations. Mm -hmm. Like diagnostic labels are a great way to clinically communicate in a shorthand way, an idea of what someone might be seeing. But there are so many variations of that that you have to, you still have to look into that. So just because, just because, um, and that again, that's something I think my industry needs to do a, just a much better job at educating people on. Labels are useful to a point, but mm -hmm. they also have a lot of limitations. Like I felt validated when I got that, when I got that label, because it meant um, that autism label, because it meant I wasn't alone. There were enough people who have, who have some of the same struggles as me that there's a, there's a name for it. Mm -hmm. And 
that was so validating for me. But at the same time, especially with something like autism, where the only where the only images people have of autism are like freaking Sheldon Cooper, which I, I cannot stand that show, by the way. <laughs> I cannot stand mm -hmm. that show because the entirety of the humor is aimed at people like me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not to laugh with us, to laugh at us, that we do not understand mm -hmm. the normal people. It, I, I'll say this real quick. If you want to fully understand that, there is a YouTube video out there that is called Big Bang Theory Without the Laugh Track. Oh, yeah. It I've is one it. of the most uncomfortable things to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's aside from the misogyny and every yeah. other oh, every other part, yeah. there are so many aspects to that show that I, I have a serious problem with. But the, at its core... The, the the humor of that show is a, is punching down at people like me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and that is a massive problem. We've I mean, especially since most of us on the spectrum have already been bullied our entire lives. A lot of us on the spectrum, I should say. Um, so it, it it so yeah. I to to go back to that question. I have a complicated relationship with those diagnostic labels because I'm in both worlds. I see the problems. I also see the usefulness, and mm -hmm. I don't know how how to fix that because clinicians need a way of of communicating ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it, it is a different language. Clinical language is a different language, yeah. even if the words are the same. Yeah, I think the problem is it's a great shorthand when clinicians are speaking with each other. What happens often is, in my office anyway, people will come in with a diagnosis. And the problem is, and this is partly both the clinician's issue and the media's issue, is people will come in with a diagnosis and ideas about that diagnosis, which are not relevant necessarily to their own experience or to their diagnosis. And so it's very confusing. Um, I had someone ask about, okay, so you've got ADHD, you know, how do you, essentially, how do you cure it? When does it end? And it's like, um, I actually, I actually have something know? on that one. Um, mm. uh, Bob Billy G underscore uh, 2000 says, I am autistic as well. I'm, be uh, I'm no longer wanting to hide that because of Dr. B and some of their factors. I really think that uh, people need to understand that ASD children will grow up with, uh, to be ASD adults. Uh, the thing we do as children are the same things we do as adults. Uh, one example of one nasty thing that's uh, being said to me is quote, uh, oh, just grow up. Uh, ASD yeah. is not that just a, a child thing. Ah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So it's... much compassion for that experience. Yeah, so Billy. Sorry. I, I've, I've heard that one a lot too. Um, mm. quit being so melodramatic, tough enough, quit being such a wimp, grow up, just deal with it. Um, when it's in, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, because it's also because it's an invisible diagnosis, it's an invisible disability. Um, people have a hard time accepting it, especially if you, we get caught up on these binary labels of functional, non-functional, yeah. mm -hmm. smart, not smart, capable, incapable. When the, when the reality, um, when the reality is it's more complicated than that. Like I, I talked about my own cognitive profile um, and there's, the fact that my my ability scores and this is part of the reason i like to think about it like a like a character sheet mm -hmm. you don't if, if you're playing um if you're playing a tabletop rpg you don't have just one stat that means good yeah. and it's the same thing it's the same thing in our lives we don't have just one stat that means good not good strong you know capable not capable it's more yeah. nuanced than that and um and so thinking about it in those terms is something that actually I, 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 I teach managers because there are so many of us that flew under the radar because we were good at school or certain mm -hmm. aspects of school. You know, you're smart. How I, I've you know, you're smart. How can, how can you be autistic? Well, because <laughs> funnily enough, that's not one of the diagnostic criteria. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and and now I'm. This is where the anger is starting. Oh yeah, out. no, that's I'm fine. It's like I'm getting getting sassy. I'm just. Mm. Um, but the. That's again. I think that's something that my industry needs to do. A, 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 
industry needs to do a better job at educating people on not just giving them the labels, but te giving people labels, but teaching people, what does this label mean? I want to see more, pe more people in mental health backgrounds uh, who are taught better science communication skills, because, um, un unfortunately we, what I didn't learn this in school, that science communication skills are different than scientific understanding skills. And there are a lot totally. of researchers who are really terrible communicators about their research. And now, thankfully, there are some people on places like like Twitter and YouTube who do a really good job of understanding the research. I mentioned how to ADHD. I I love her channel. Um, we you know uh, we're very close, and I know all the research she puts into things. But there are a lot. There's a lot of information out there on Twitter that's just really bad information on yeah. TikTok too. Oh, like there's yeah. one that's going around that just irks me. Um, object impermanence like the way it's being used a lot of the time it's not what it means mm -hmm. yeah. and so people uh, i i keep seeing therapists who um the uh, there I, I keep hearing about therapists friends of mine who have people coming in with the stuff they've learned from the internet there's good information out there too but there's also just a lot of bad information and they have to help them unlearn some of that information. And I would just love it if therapists and mental health professionals would step up and educate people so they didn't need to go to TikTok. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, I'm actually really bothered by this idea that, you know, um, grow up, cope with it. What I hear people saying then is, I don't want to have to cope with you. Yep. And now no wonder people on the spectrum or with ADHD experience resent, rejection sensitivity. It's not just in innuendo or in what's not said or in what's hinted at. It's directly said as in, wow, I'm so tired of having to deal with you mm -hmm. one way or another. Yeah. And, or just basically be different. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it ends up being insidious because there's a lot of things like I'm, I recognize the fact that like where I really struggle, uh, where my autism is absolutely most apparent is, um, in re in romantic relationships where my need, because I was taught neurotypical dating skills. Every, almost everybody is taught neurotypical dating skills. I don't know anybody mm -hmm. out there. Again, I'm, 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 I'm giving a lot of shout outs to how to ADHD because I know she's talked about this. Mm -hmm. I was actually in that video. Um, about like relationship accommodations. Um, there's almost nobody out there that I can think of who is talking about neurodiverse dating skills. Mm. And so the people I've dated, my ex-wife expected me to norm, to re respond with neurotypical responses and to i expected them to meet my needs in a neurotypical way and it's only i'm nearly 40 and i'm just learning yeah. how to exist in romantic relationships without that yeah w being able to yeah. recognize that i have different needs than most other people do and that's okay um I've got two more questions here uh, yeah, before, we, be before we round out the, the episode. One of them, I, one of them, I really want to ask you because of a conversation you and I actually had, um, God, months ago now. Uh, question mm -hmm. is uh, uh, this is from uh, Mox Pro, by the way. If Big Bang Theory is a great example of how not to do uh, ASD representation, what's a good positive example of ASD in popular media? I actually don't have any. Mm. Yeah. I, I can't think. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, they may exist at this point, but I will be really honest with you. I tend to not watch mental health or autism themed shows and movies because um, one of two things is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Either it's done so badly that I'm going to be just angry mm -hmm. or it's done so well it hits too close to home and I can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I have yet to I have I have personally yet to see a really good representation of autism in the media, um, but what I will say is, step beyond certain disability tropes of making us like the mystical saviors. Um, we're not savants. That is a rare. That is a truly exceptionally rare thing. Like the good doctor, um, the good doctor is you know, he's, he's only accepted because he has socially acceptable skills to an incredible degree. It's in many respects, bones was the same way. Yep. Um, and so 
I, I would love to see some representations of autism. You know, I, oh, it's, it just kills me that it's in this franchise that they did it so well, actually. Mm -hmm. It just, mm, I wish it weren't this franchise, but freaking Newt Scamander. Oh. Newt Scamander yeah. was, I wept watching Newt Scamander in the first Fantastic Beasts movie because he was awkward. He was clearly autistic and he was different and they accepted that that was fine. And he was the hero. He got the girl. It, you know, it, it, there are, that's the only example I can think of where you have a fairly obviously autistic character who is just accepted for being different is still gets to be heroic, still gets to be autistic. Now they don't actually call him out as autistic, but he's, he's autistic. <laughs> um, special interest, stereotype movements, troubles with body language and reciprocity. He's autistic. Um, but they just accept it. And he still gets to be the hero. Mm -hmm and a romantic a romantic interest that does not exist and i really wish it existed outside the harry potter yeah. franchise i Gosh, really I really wish existed yeah. outside the harry mm -hmm. potter franchise mm -hmm. yeah um the the last question i've got here is i feel like a good one that's a bridge between this episode and next week uh this mm -hmm. comes from uh malinol i think i'm sorry again i'm sorry if i say your name's wrong i apologize um i find it really difficult to distinguish between autism and adhd without hyperactivity mm -hmm. do you have a stance on this um well there's there's a lot of related aspects to both and i was i was actually just talking uh recently to um to a cognitive researcher who uh, hypothesized that they that they're on a related spectrum. Um, there's not really a lot of evidence for that yet, but she she thinks that's where things are headed. Uh, but ADHD symptoms are expected for a lot of us on the spectrum, um, and especially for the so uh, there's actually a really good organization called the Awake Project. The AWAKE project it stands for Autism at uh, Asp Aspie Autistic Women Awareness Knowledge and Empowerment Project, and they talk heavily about the different gender presentations of both ADHD and autism because there are significant differences a mm -hmm. lot of the time, and that's the reason. Um, they're, 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 that's the reason that a lot of women, especially girls and non-binary folks, f fly under the radar for this stuff because traditionally, you know, traditionally uh, boys tend to act out when they're young. They cause trouble. Um, girls are more prone to going, kind of going inward. And, and so... The people who go inward tend to fly under the radar because, I mean, if you're, an, if you're an overworked teacher with 35 kids in the class and one kid is setting the room on fire and the others are just not paying attention, who's getting the attention? And that's part of the reason I flew under the radar as well, because I go inward. I, I have that more inattentive type presentation um, for both autism and for my ADHD-like symptoms. So... Um, not sure that answered your question fully, um, but I'm no, I, <laughs> I'm deep within the feels and I'm kind of scatterbrained. Yeah, right no, now. no, and and I and I think it I think it really did. Um, but yeah, we we have unfortunately run out of time. Um, I do uh, apologize to everybody whose questions who I didn't get to, uh, but uh, you y'all were knocking out the part. And there were a few ADHD questions, and I do encourage you to come back next week uh, because that is what our topic of discussion is going to be about. Um, but, uh, but yeah, friends, where can people find you, uh, if they, they want to see on the internets? Uh, you can always find me on Twitter at Mitra Jordan, uh, and my website, uh, MitraJordan.com. And I encourage people to reach out if they'd like to. So, um, yeah, just to say next week, we'll be talking about all about ADHD. We'll be talking about late diagnosis, early diagnosis. What's it like as a woman? What's it like if you're Trevor? Um, <laughs> what's it like if you're Mitra? Because I don't want to speak for everyone. I just have to throw that in there. I know. I just like that. What, what it's fun. like if you're a woman. What it's like if you're a Trevor. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> What's it like if you're non-binary? I can't speak for everyone yeah. again, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm Dr. B again, Rafael Bocamazzo, Doctor of Clinical Psychology. Um, yeah, you can find me at the Doctor B T H E E D O C T O R B as in boy. Um, and uh, you can also follow Take This at Take This Org. We're actually in the middle of a the last two days of a huge fundraiser, Parker Boxed In Experience, sponsored and presented by Idol Champions. It's true. Um, Go get it's that really psychomancer. Fantastic. Yeah, you if you donate ten dollars or more to that, you get a psychomancer skin for Beetle and Grim in game. Yeah. They they look amazing. It it's, looks so I mean, cool. It's after our mascot, the psychomancer. And I get um, paid it, today, and that's the first thing I'm doing. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. I've already used the psychomancer skin. Um, it's great. And uh I I already saw Abed mentioned in the chat. They kind of went back and forth on Abed and autism versus psychosis and a bunch of other things, but autism was still pretty I mean, uh Abed was still pretty awesome representation in terms of how well he was mm. accepted by his friends. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. But yeah, what once more I want to thank you again for doing this. Uh this I, I'm I'm yeah. I know it was a lot, and uh, I just we, we love you, man. <laughs> um, uh, vulnerability, emotions. I know. Ah. Ew, get it off. Ah, I hate it. Emotions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find me on the Difficulty Class uh, podcast every Friday, as well as Champions of Lore here on Twitch.tv slash CNE Games every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, as well on Twitter at the Trevor. There's an A hiding in there. You can find the podcast that I make way too many of. Uh, thank you to Jay for moderating the chat. You did a fantastic job today. Uh, thank you. Or not to say you don't, you know, any other day. You always do a good job, Jay. Uh, thank you to Codename Entertainment and Take This for giving us an opportunity to have these conversations. And if you missed any part of this show, you can catch it later as a podcast at 2 p.m. on your favorite podcast services. And you can write in with your suggestion for future topics to Champions of Psychology at CodenameEntertainment.com. Yes, I know those are a lot of letters, but copy and paste. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, for those of us uh, live uh, in the chat right now, come back at 1 p.m. for Bardic Inspiration with Dylan, Jason, uh, Charles Miller. Uh, and if you're listening to us later, we'd love to see you next week in the chat uh, for the ADHD AMA. And we're sorry that we missed you this week. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that is going to do it. So until next week, take care of yourself. Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment.